Hot. Well, I am Pastor Chris, as I mentioned before, and I'm glad that you are here today. We are in the fourth and final week of a sermon series coming out of a book uh, written by a man by the name of Ken Sandy. Ken is a Christian lawyer who specializes in reconciliation. Um, he works largely in the secular world, but wrote a book uh, that has huge applications in the church, in our personal lives, and then has also resourced it with other things to go along with uh, helping people resolve conflict in a business setting. So at whatever level you may be having conflict, it is a great tool, a great set of resources. If you want to know more about it, you can buy the book. You can go online to peacemaker.net and see a lot more. I am, I am just scratching the surface, so to speak, of the materials that they have. And, and it is really, really good materials. I, I've made mention of this before. Um, there's a few books in your life that you'll read, and I've read lots of books. You can see my library in the office if you want sometime. But I've read lots of books, and lots of good books, and some bad books, but a few books in your life will stand out that, that just resonate, that rise to the top as being ones that were profoundly impacting. And uh, particularly when it comes to my personal faith, this book by Ken Sandy was one that just kind of blew me away. I was in seminary when I first encountered it. It was required reading, which means sometimes you don't really want to always have to read it. But I read it nonetheless, and as I started just to get in a little ways to the book, I realized this is really something everybody needs to know about, and was just astonished at, at how, how wise my professor was for picking this particular book. It was, it was remarkable. So it was just one of those lasting impact books that uh, I, I was blessed with, and so as I go through a lot of this material, if you want to know more and in-depth, that's the place to find it. If you do have kids today, they are welcome to go to our children's church. Um, we have an age-appropriate lesson for preschool on up through fourth grade with uh, Tony and her team. They meet in the lower level, and when they're done, they usually get a little bit of playtime in the gym if, if I happen to run a bit long. If you need to find your kids, they'll either be below us or in the gym following worship, and that's where they will be at. And as I said, we're in week four. Uh, the first week, we talked about glorifying God. One of the most difficult things to do in conflict is to bring glory to God in the midst of it. Uh, that can be incredibly difficult. And so we talked about what that looks like and how that needs to be our aim and our goal, because as Christians, we are called to live differently, and because of that, we are called to have conflict differently as well. And uh, all these sermons are online. If you missed them, go back and watch them because I, I do think uh, they are worth your time. And that's not because I preached them. It's because the Word of God is strong in them, and I think it's worth your time. Uh, the second week, we talked about getting the log out of your own eye, of course. So again, straight from Scripture, we oftentimes look at the person we're in conflict with and say, Oh, da, 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 you know, you've done this, or you said that, or you behaved this way. When all the time, as Scripture says, we're looking at a little, little speck in their eye, and we've got like a... A big old two-by-four sticking out of ours, right? And, and we kind of often look like hypocrites and we make ourselves look bad. And we make Christians look bad as a whole because we're not dealing with our own things and we're just trying to deal with somebody else's. And so the next step in that process is to get the log out of our own eye. And then last week we talked about gently restoring and, and, and what it looks like then as we've dealt with these first two steps, now we're starting to move finally to the point where we go and start to begin to address this with the other person. In fact, the first two steps of, of conflict resolution as a Christian are not dealing with the other person. They're, they're dealing with how am I going to deal with conflict and how am I dealing with myself. Getting ourselves right. And once we get ourselves right, then we begin to get to a place where we can now finally start to think, how do I find a, a, a meeting point with this other person that we might be able to be restored and then that, of course, brings us to this week. And we're going to be in Colossians 3.13 today. And it's uh, simply about how do we go and be reconciled. And, and as I thought about it this week, I, I found a video that I think serves it perfectly. I have the perfect solution to all of your problems. This, this video that we're going to watch in here and the second one that comes up is, is the magic pill, so to speak, to resolve your conflict. I just never thought it could happen to me to my own family, to my friends. It was like we were trapped in this black hole of anger and resentment. Or was it an abyss of hurt and rejection? Or maybe it was a cavern of fear and loathing. Anyway, it was like the walls were just closing in on me. Family reunions, holidays, potluck suppers, family arm wrestling contests, 
all seem to bring out the worst in us. Those long-standing grudges and unresolved conflicts would seem to rear their ugly heads. The last thing I wanted to do was have another get-together at our house. Then my doctor told me about Reconcilisec. Reconcilisec is the safe, easy, and effective way to bring relational reconciliation to you and your friends any time of the year. Reconcilisec is recommended for all occasions where friends and family need a little help getting over those long-held resentments and bitter grudges. Reconcilisec is not for people who are dating or engaged or may become engaged. Use extreme caution when taking Reconcilisec when in the presence of in-laws. In lab tests, in-laws taking Reconcilisec showed no improvement. Relational conflicts involving money or inheritance also showed no improvement. Take Reconcilisec at least 30 minutes before any anticipated conflict. Sharing Reconcilisec with others may increase your chances of reconciliation. So if you're looking for immediate reconciliation with the ones you're supposed to love, look no further. Ask your doctor if Reconcilisec is right for you. Thank you, Reconcilisec! Ask your doctor about Reconcilisec. Side effects may include excessive hugging, chronic handholding, inexplicable affection for in-laws, and sloppy kisses from aunts and grandmas. Exceeding recommended doses may result in marriage proposals or pregnancy. If you experience reconciliation lasting more than 24 hours, that means the drug is working. Other side effects may include dry mouth, headache, diarrhea, diphtheria, vomiting, dizziness, earache, nosebleeds, acid reflux, indigestion, euphoria, leprosy, and plague. My favorite side effect is sloppy kisses from grandmas. <laughs> but wouldn't it be wonderful if life were just that easy, right? Have a problem with somebody? Give them the pill. Kids talking back to you? Reconcile a sec in their juice box, right? Coworkers talking behind your back? Bake them some cookies with some pills on the inside. That would be great. Huh? Anybody else? Who, who's going to sign up tomorrow for a case? If I was selling... Come on. What would a hundred of these run me, Pastor? Tell me. That, that's, that's probably what you're thinking, right? And today, as I said, we're going to conclude this series that I've been preaching the past three weeks, talking about conflict and how we need to handle conflict as Christians, how we need to react and, and, and how we need to respond to the conflict. That, truthfully, because we live in a broken, sinful world, this conflict, for most of us, is in our each and every day lives. And as I mentioned, our key verse is going to come from Colossians. If you uh, want to, you can grab a Bible from the chair in front of you or open up a phone app. The version's a good one and follow along on that. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 12. Uh, verse 13 is the focus today, but I'm going to start in 12 and you'll see how the rest of it all fits in nicely together. And, and just as an unrelated quick side note, as, as you're looking up Colossians, if you're flipping through your Bible, the, the way that I remember how to find Colossians, you know, with these epistles, it can be hard to remember their order. I just remember General Electric Power Company. So you got Galatians, right? G, Electric, Ephesians, Philippians, General Electric Power Company. Colossians. That's the only way, literally. I've been finding in my Bible these epistles for 25 or 30 years that way. So General Electric Power Company. If you're young, you don't understand what General Electric is, I understand. But the rest of us, we know what General Electric was or is, and, and you can find it that way. So we're going to be in uh, uh, Colossians 3, and I'm going to read for you 12 through 14. And Paul says uh, in this passage, he says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you might have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So forgive as God forgave you, right? Let me read that again for you, that, that verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you might have against one another and forgive as the Lord forgave you. How many of you have ever thought or, or maybe said something like the following? I forgive you, but I can't be close to you again because of what you have done to me. Right? How many of you here are, are today only kind of forgivers? Anyone else? Yeah, kind of forgivers? I kind of forgive you for that, but not really. Or, or I only forgive you this far, right? I only forgive you this 
portion. We do that, don't we? Let's be honest, huh? I've done it. And when we do this, we find ourselves practicing a form of forgiveness that is neither biblical nor healing. What what would happen if God forgave you in this very same way, right? To put it another way, how would you feel if you got down on your knees, you prayed to Jesus, Jesus, I'm confessing this sin to you, and you responded, hey buddy, I forgive you, but ah, we can't be close again. You've really screwed up. Huh. Would you like that response from Jesus? Would you feel forgiven? I don't think you would. And as Christians, we cannot overlook that there is a a direct relationship between God's forgiveness of us and how we then are supposed to forgive others as well. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. It said when I read it just a moment ago, right? Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. That's a tough standard, isn't it? But God is very, very clear in his expectation of us. And that expectation sets the bar very high. Fortunately for us, not only is God gracious, but he's also willing to help us be gracious as well. Here's something I've learned slowly in life. Slowly. I am not good at forgiving other people. Right? I'm so bad at it, I made them put it on the screen. I'm not good at forgiving people. Nope, I'm not. Sorry, not sorry. Well, I actually am sorry, but... I mean... I feel hurt, right? You made me angry, right? It cost me money, it cost me time, or you embarrassed me. That makes it hard for me to want to forgive you. And sometimes, sometimes I'm just stubborn and I don't want to forgive. Because, you know, if I don't forgive you now, I can use that later, right? That's a bargaining chip for some future argument. I can use that as a weapon the next time we have a fight. Now, of course, the other bad option is that you can always try to not think about how you were hurt. Not think about what that person said or did about you, right? You can stuff all those feelings of hurt and harm and pain, betrayal. You can stuff them deep down inside and try to put on a fake smile so it looks like everything's good, right? You show up at church and, oh, everything's great, although you just had a fight in the parking lot with your wife. Hey, nice to see you today. Shaking hands. Good to see you. (laughs) Yeah, wait till church is over, honey. Right? Some of us push those feelings down. Does it go away then? Nope. It festers. It rots. It slowly poisons you. And here's a truth that I want to walk out here with you today a little bit. Unless unless your heart is cleansed and changed by God the memories, the feelings, the hurt, the pain will still be lurking in the background of our lives. And what it does then is it it taints our thoughts. It taints our words. It prevents us from rebuilding trust and relationships. We, We drag that with us like baggage through the airport, right? And it messes up our current and future relationships. Unless you let God work in you, helping you deal with that pain, you are unlikely to get beyond that pain and to grow from that pain. You have to let God in. He has to help you to see His grace, the grace that He's had for you, and then show you how you, how you can take that and pass that same grace onto others. The only way this is going to happen for us, though, is for us to realize that we cannot forgive on our own strength, and that we, we desperately need God to come in and change our heart. How many of you know what I'm saying is true? It is. Without God's help, I cannot truly forgive when somebody else really hurts me. 
sure I can get over the little things. We've talked about that previously. I'm talking about the big things, right? Divorce, hatred, abandonment, betrayal, and many other things as well. If I don't ask God to help me, if I don't pursue God in my frustration and pain, there's no possible way that I can forgive as God has forgiven me. Let's talk about forgiveness for a moment. Just so we're clear on what forgiveness means. To understand what forgiveness is, we must first see what forgiveness is not. See, forgiveness is not a feeling. When you forgive someone, it is an action. It is an act of will. Forgiveness involves a series of decisions in our life. The first of which should be to call on God to change our hearts. And then, as God gives us His grace, We must then decide not to think or talk about someone who's hurt us, not to multiply the pain that's going on, but instead to seek reconciliation in that moment. And God calls us to make these decisions regardless of whatever our feelings might be. And that can be tough at times where we've been deeply wounded. But by doing this, These decisions that we make with the power of God in us can lead to remarkable changes in our feelings. And then the second step in this, of what forgiveness is not, is forgiveness is not forgetting. You see, forgetting is a passive process. Forgetting honestly rarely works, right? If you've been hurt, forgetting almost never works. Forgiving, on the other hand, is an active process because it involves a conscious choice on our part, being deliberate, taking a course of action and choosing to move forward in it. And then finally, forgiveness is absolutely not excusing. Excusing says, oh, that's okay, right? We live in Minnesota. We know what Minnesota nice is. Passive-aggressive, right? Right? If we're known for two things, it's Minnesota nice and Minnesota goodbyes. Well, and the Vikings not winning a Super Bowl, but we're not going to talk about that. It's too much pain there. But forgiveness is not excusing. Excusing says that's okay. And it implies that something wasn't really wrong, or maybe the person couldn't help it, right? But in fact, forgiveness is the opposite of excusing. The fact that someone needs to be forgiven indicates that something was wrong and inexcusable. And because forgiveness deals honestly with sin, it can bring a freedom that no amount of excusing ever could hope to provide. Got that? So let's move on to the next point, hopefully, if you do. Second point is simply this. We have to look out for the interests of others. If we want reconciliation, we have to look out for the interests of others. Philippians 2.4 says, each of you, this is believers in Christ, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Here's something that, that will revolutionize your peacemaking once you get it figured out. If the person you are in conflict with realizes in the middle of that conflict that you are actually looking out for their best interests, that conflict completely changes its direction. The the severity of the conflict when the other person realizes you are actually looking out for their best interests, the the severity of it, it comes down, right? Things become less contentious. Tones are lowered. Resolution comes far more quickly when the other person realizes that you are just looking out for their best interest. But the key is, you have to be genuinely looking out for that person's interest, right? Otherwise, they're going to smell a rat. And things will likely go from bad to worse if they think you're faking it. But by doing this, we can reduce our conflict. Because you see, for many of us, probably most of us, Our natural instinct in the midst of argumentation is is to resort to kind of a a competitive style of argumentation, right? 
This can be that, that, that one-upping of one another in the middle of an argument. Having a, a longer list of things you've been hurt by than the other person, right? Um, deeper hurts, maybe. You, well, you, I hurt you there, but you hurt me here, right? And we roll them all out. Now, while a, a competitive approach to life isn't always a bad thing, in the middle of conflict, it rarely produces the best solution. And it certainly doesn't produce the best solution for both people. And so we have to seek to have conflict in a different way because the margin between competitive and combative is too slim for us in the heated moments of argumentation to be able to rarely, rarely do we have the ability to discern it. The better answer to conflict is try to take a cooperative approach. How do we resolve this conflict in a way that it might be a win-win. Is there a, is there a win-win option? How can, or at the very least, how can we resolve this without both parties ending up hurt worse? Right? How many times have you went to deal with conflict with somebody and it only got worse instead of getting better? Anybody else ever had that problem? Yeah? By working with the person we are in conflict with, rather than against them, we are more likely to communicate well, we're more likely to appreciate their underlying needs, and more likely to have in mind what their concerns are. And the result of this is often wiser and more complete solutions. And everyone wins as we look out for the interest of others. So on to point number three. Simply this, overcome evil with good. Romans 12.21 says, Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Here's something I've learned in my life. Making peace, easier said than done. Right? Easier said than done. Making peace isn't always as easy as we'd like it to be. Sometimes people are stubborn. Sometimes people get defensive, and they resist even our best efforts to be reconciled. Sometimes they'll even be immature and antagonistic in the middle of conflict, right? And, and they'll find new ways to frustrate us, frustrate us and, and then find different ways than before to mistreat us. And this, of course, often it, it triggers a reaction for us to strike back. And now we're caught up in this, this vicious cycle of getting even, right? The good old eye for an eye, right? This was the rule of the playground when I was a kid. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, eye for an eye was the rules of the world. And if you, if you, if you punch me, you better look out next recess because I'm going to get you, fool. Right? I pity the fool who messes with me. Anybody remember Mr. T? Yeah. That's the way the world works. An eye for an eye. You get me, I'm getting you back. But here's the thing. And... and uh, this is my fourth week of preaching on this, so, so hopefully you're starting to catch on if you've been here for them. Those of us who profess to love Jesus Christ as our Lord, as our King, and as our Savior, we are called to be different. To live differently. Different from a world that pays back evil with evil. Different from a world where, where getting even is the goal. Revenge, not reconciliation, rules the day. Remember what Romans 12, 21 just told us? Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, so what about Jesus, right? Anybody know what Jesus had to say about any of this? Luke 6. In Luke 6, Jesus gives us the direction we are supposed to go. We who love him are supposed to live this way. Jesus says, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray. Pray for those who mistreat you. And a little later in chapter 6, he says, Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, as your Father is merciful. Now, from a, a worldly perspective, this approach seems, frankly, 
naive, it almost seems to appear to concede defeat. But the world's ways are not God's ways. We have profound power through Christ. We see all sorts of examples of this in the life of Paul, if you've studied the Apostle Paul. When he was subjected to to intense and just repeated personal attacks, he didn't respond in kind in any way. See, Paul never prayed for God to destroy his enemies. He never returned evil with evil, right? That was the old way for Paul. Back when he was running around and persecuting and killing Christians. That was the old way for Paul. But because Paul was a follower of the Messiah, because he had been transformed, because he had been changed by an experience with Jesus, he was a new man and he responded to conflict in new ways. And because of this transformation, he had the freedom to turn away from sinful responses and to respond in ways that were more Christ-like. And that, after all, is the primary pursuit for anyone who's a Christian. To be more obedient to Christ. Paul understood that God had given us divine weapons to use in our quest for peace. Things like scripture, prayer, truth, righteousness, grace, love, self-control that he speaks about. To the world, these seem like basically useless weapons. Yet, these were the very weapons that Jesus used to defeat Satan and to conquer the world. Since Jesus chose to use these weapons instead of resorting to worldly responses, we are called to do the same. Let's return to Romans 12. One last time. But I want to add verse 20 to verse 21. Paul writes, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil by evil with good. That's it, folks. That's our ultimate weapon. The neutron bomb of conflict resolution is love. How long can your enemy resist this weapon if you use it? And even if they resist, God will be glorified. I'll close with a story that will hopefully clearly set in your mind the power of love. Some of you may be familiar with Ernest Gordon's marvelous book. It's a book called To End All Wars, or or you may know it uh, by a different name. Uh, Its older title was Through the Valley of the Kwai. Mr. Gordon was a, a soldier who was captured in World War II by the Japanese along with a bunch of other British prisoners. And they were forced to endure years of horrible treatment while building the notorious Railroad of Death in Thailand. And literally, they would work you to death there. And if you died while you were working building this rail line, they literally just pushed you off and kept on moving. That's how things worked. And faced with starvation, disease, and all the pains and ills of the prison camp, the brutality, just just absolutely brutal conditions of their captors. I mean, they killed hundreds of his comrades. Gordon nonetheless survived to become an inspiring example of the triumph of Christian love against human evil. In the book, Gordon tells of a day where this love shone especially bright. You see, he and his fellow prisoners came upon a a trainload of wounded Japanese soldiers. They were being transported to Bangkok. Here's how, how Gordon describes God's work of grace that day. He says, these Japanese soldiers, they were on their own. They were without medical care. Their uniforms were encrusted with mud, blood, and excrement. The wounds that they had, he says, were sorely inflamed, full of of pus, crawling with maggots. He said, we could understand now 
why the Japanese were so cruel to their prisoners. If they didn't care for their own, why should they care for us? He says, these wounded soldiers looked at us forlornly as they sat in the trains with their heads hanging, resting against the carriages, waiting fatalistically for death to come for many of them. He says, they were the refuse of war. There was nowhere to go and no one to care for them. He says, that day, without a word, most of the officers in his section unbuckled their packs, took out a portion of the small portion of rations they had been given, grabbed a rag or two with their water canteens, and went right over to the Japanese, climbed into the train, and began to help them. He says, our guards tried to prevent us, but we ignored them, and we knelt down by the side of the enemy and gave them food and water and helped clean and bind their wounds and a smile, even though we didn't say, speak in the same language. And as we loved and served these soldiers, many cries of arigato came, which in Japanese means thank you. He says, as I observed this and became part of this, I regarded my comrades with wonder. Eighteen months ago, they would have joined readily in the destruction of our captors had they fallen into our hands. Now these very same men were dressing the enemy's wounds. We had experienced a moment of grace right there in those blood-stained railway cars. God had broken through the barriers of our prejudice and had given us the will to obey His command. Thou shalt love. Most of us will never be subjected to this kind of abuse. To have to reach across that grade of a chasm to love those who have wronged us. But the principles apply no matter what, no matter how great or how small the conflict. As we love our enemies, as we go to be reconciled, as we bring Christ and God's grace, we will be transformed. And then we can transform the world all for God's glory. I think we can do this. No, in fact... I know we can do this. Let's be agents of change. Let's be known as a gracious people. Let's be hope to the world around us. As the old song says, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Pray with me if you would. Father God, as we look at conflict, I know each and every one of us have experienced this, many of us in many ways, shapes, and forms. We live in a broken, a sinful world where conflict hurts us and where we frankly, if we're honest, we hurt others. And God, in this day, I just pray that we would hear your calling upon our hearts that we are to live differently And that you don't just call us to live differently, but you have equipped us to live differently. That through the power of Jesus Christ, that through your grace, that the forgiveness you have given us has shown us there is a new way, a better way, a way different from the world. And so, Father God, in this moment, I know... Talking about conflict can be very uncomfortable. Sometimes it sounds like the pastor's meddling a little bit. Maybe he is. But God, it is your word, and your word is true. And God, if we are willing to submit to it, your word will not return empty. So God, it is my humble prayer that you would transform the conflicts in our lives. God, some of us came here needing to find freedom. We've been dragging with us pains, aches, hurts, harms, problems from our past. And as we drag those, God, they hold us back. We can't live in freedom if we hold on to those. We can't find freedom if we try to find revenge. 
So God, whatever name, whatever face you've popped into our hearts and into our heads today, God, the places where we need to go and be reconciled, I pray, God, that we would take this seriously, that we would take the steps to see it through. And God, you don't promise us that every reconciliation will happen. But Lord, if we do it in a way that brings you glory, honor, and praise, at least we can be changed and transformed. At least we can be set free. God, may we find freedom. Challenge us, Lord, to step out in faith, to trust you, that you are greater than whatever has happened in our past. And that because we are forgiven, so too may we forgive. Lord, we thank you. We love you for your grace, for your mercy, and for your love. It is in Jesus' high and holy and beautiful name we pray. Amen. If you need some prayer today, we'll have a prayer team here at the front. Come on up and pray with them. They'd love to pray with you. Whether it's about conflict or anything else, they would love to just have a moment with you. Otherwise, go forth and serve your King. Amen. Amen.